Welcome to Field Modes! And do you know what today is? Well, no you don't know what today is because today is the first day, but today is Anthropology Day! Along with studying geology, I also study anthropology. Really, that's just a result of severe indecision. Today I'm going to take you far away to the land of pyramids and pharaohs and tell you about my favorite Egyptian of all time. And I bet you don't know her. Her name is Hatshepsut and she's basically a badass. Now if you have heard of her, then you probably know that she was a ruler of Egypt. And for a decent amount of time, too. What you don't know is how badly mainstream Egypt documentaries have messed up her image. Mostly what you see is a scheming shrew of a woman who stole the throne away from an unsuspecting baby. But let's consider a different path. First, let's look at her lineage since that's how thrones are passed down. Now hold on, because there's a lot of Tutmoses gonna come at ya. Her dad was Tutmos I and was born to the royal wife or the primary wife. In this marriage, no son was produced, but that's okay because the king has a harem of women in which an heir could be produced. And from one of these women, also known as a secondary wife, a son was produced and he was, get this, called Tutmos II, who was then married to Hatshepsut. Egypt is a weird place, guys. Soon after Tutmos II and Hatshepsut were king and queen of Egypt, he dies. In the Tutmos II and Hatshepsut marriage, there was no son produced, but a secondary wife did produce a son near the very end, right before Tutmos II died. His name was Tutmos III, and a big surprise. However, Tutmos III is only an infant, and an infant can't very effectively run Egypt. Well, in Egypt, it is common that the heir is not going to be ready to take the throne when his father dies. Well, in Egypt, they have something known as a co-regency, where one, the king is actually king in name, but there's somebody else who's doing all of the kingly duties. In this case, that someone was Hatshepsut. And it's at this point that she begins her total and complete takeover of the kingship. Soon after becoming a co-regent, she adopts a throne name, which is typical of the kings of Egypt, but she isn't a king yet. Another thing that you may know about Hatshepsut is that she built a lot of stuff. And she was actually the first non-king to commission a pair of obelisks to be built. An obelisk, if you don't know what that is, is what the Washington Monument is, except these are all Egyptified. By year seven of her co-regency, she is king in everything but title itself. In this year, her official coronation occurs and she goes on doing everything she had been doing, but now she has the title of king. She also had expeditions to Punt, which traded luxury goods to Egypt, which represented the wealth and prosperity of the nation at this time. It is often assumed she wasn't active military perhaps because she was a woman, and perhaps because there isn't a lot of military activity represented in the texts from her reign. But after she died, a lot of her things were destroyed, and this may be why we don't find any evidence of her being militarily active, because they may have been destroyed. She is often depicted as wearing the traditional king's clothing, the fake beard and the triangular shaped loincloth. Some of the reasons scholars and I don't buy into the scheming shrew of a woman who robbed the throne from the innocence of Tutmos III is because there doesn't seem to be any animosity between her and her stepson nephew. Hatshepsut dies in year 22 of her reign and Tutmos III becomes king. There are a lot of hyped up dramas about how Tutmos III came back and killed his aunt stepmother. This is just unnecessarily dramatic because he didn't have to kill her, he just had to wait until she died. Unfortunately, Hatshepsut's reign is marred by the fact that her name has been carved out of monuments and stelas. Her stepson nephew did do this, but only after 20 years into his reign. This probably happened because a female king disrupts the balance of what is considered a male job. Hatshepsut is often compared to the likes of Joan of Arc and Queen Elizabeth, and rightfully so. She represents strong-willed women throughout history. She didn't let what society thought she should do interfere with what she thought was best for her country and for her. And Egypt prospered because of it. Still, there continues to be the stigma surrounding her reign based on what women can and cannot do. So there you are, a brief introduction to this badass Egyptian king. There are a list of references down below. There are lots of articles on Hatshepsut and we have barely scratched the surface of what she was about. So read the articles if you are so inclined and I hope you learned something. This is Field Notes. Bye.